Hello, welcome to part two of the Raccoon Stealer analysis. So in this, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into um, the exclusive OR operations that we consistently see in this binary. Um, I'm going to do some scripting, but not IDA Python because that isn't available in the IDA free. I'm going to be doing that through um, some x64 dbg scripting um, and also talking about my analysis and how I would go about through my analysis of reverse engineering this malware. So hopefully it's interesting. Buckle up. This could be long. Um, I do talk quite a lot, so hopefully um, this is as, as insightful as it seems the other video was. Um, again, I'm sorry about the audio issues. I thought I could find my microphone this weekend. Um, unfortunately, I am stuck to this microphone um, as I cannot find it. So, you know, you might have to deal with some pretty poor audio quality, which I apologize. So this is a, this is through a headset instead of an actual mic that I enjoy. So um, very much apologies on that. Um, so yeah, let's go straight into it um, and recap very quickly that I was looking at this check mutex. I got sort of confused here because x64 dbg or x32, shall I say, was referencing addresses, which really weirded me out. Um, and that is pretty common for people like myself, where I'm sometimes a little bit dumb, where I'm like, what is going on? You know, uh, it happens quite often as you sort of, you don't guess, but you can't know everything about reverse engineering and you can't know everything about a binary. And so you have to have all eventualities really with you and then work from there. Um, one of the things I don't think I mentioned last time was the the confusing things here. So uh, this has a clear reference where IDA's been able to disassemble it. These these could have references that have not been identified by IDA's disassembly engine. And by saying that, I mean the assembly instructions that are within this binary, um, the way that it's disassembled it, it's found a link here where it's been able to identify it as a closed off functionality and it's been able to send it a link. And I've renamed it, if you remember, as main, um, which which probably might have been quite unwise as it gave the documentation here with the arguments when I actually don't know um, the compiler properly. I don't know the, the arguments. I haven't looked into the features of that. But these here, they haven't fully been identified. The best way I'd say about this, if you are confused about these, is work out if there is something like this where there is the function. Work out through that first and try and work out from there and identify the functionality and then try and understand how this possibly could have occurred um, so you might need to find it because sometimes there is huge functions um, such as this where there might be an error from IDA or there might be actually it's a genuine um, disassemble and they just haven't found the link that there's a lot of eventualities but you can also start breakpointing on these if there is an issue um, there's there's certain cases where this could be legitimate um, but what I would say is first of all to get your confidence up and to get your understanding is well breakpoint on all on a live debugger for me and then first of all work through here hopefully um, where you know the links and in this case it's pretty clear that this is our main bit that we can work through that starts first which is good um, I'm actually going to uh, skip access token manipulation. I don't know how much I talked about this last video, um, but I don't want to talk about it too much. I actually want to go straight into the sort of exclusive or rewind um, understanding of this. I understand that we talked about it a little bit, but I want to talk about how you can do it manually, a little bit about endianness and also the functionality that we have here. Um, so we could revisit that soon, but for now I'm just going to skip that and move on to something else, um, which is this part of the code. So we've got is local system, which I talked about, um, and then we've got this area, which is of interest for us. So the other thing here we can see is this subroutine. Uh, this subroutine for me looks like compiler stuff. Now the interesting thing is, whoop, the interesting thing is for me is that whenever I look into a subroutine, I like to sometimes highlight on the calls to be able to understand um, what's being called and if there's a lot of functionality in there that I might need to look at. Um, also to do with that, I can't see any calls. Um, there's no jumps into the code, much like when we were unpacking where it goes into a certain bit of memory. Um, and it looks to be not too worrying just to see it, um, just step over it and see what happens. Um, 
we could revisit this perfectly fine. Um, for now, though, I'm just going to go over it. I think that's compiler stuff. And that really comes down to, especially in IDA 3, where you don't get the instant identification sometimes you would get in a more commercialized or you've paid for the product. Um, you know, it does get quite annoying slash grating to be able to try and understand, is that a compiler function or not? Um, but that that is just how it is sometimes in the free products. Um, I think the this bit here sort of wins me over for um, compiler slash uh, library slash the malware developer is definitely not doing this. Um, if they are, they're doing it in a very uh, very advanced form. For me, a lot of malware developers are lazy and so they'll only concentrate on this sort of level of interesting stuff on things that they really care about. So like making sure that crypto and stuff is settled in and done sorted and it also depends on the compiler as well so I'm gonna leave that and then I'm gonna step on these two because in crime of course you have this thing where sometimes they want to defend certain people that have a certain language on their computer and actually sometimes it can be used to target certain regions so say that you've got a Key, uh, English locale so what we mean by locale is um, in Windows you can set your settings in here or oh, do I have to go to settings to oh, so used to Windows X oh, region uh, region sense so uh, we've got our region settings here this is from the VM of course um, which we could change um, it's quite easy to manipulate and you've also got your language here as well um, which you can add languages to so it isn't too hard to manipulate this but of course by default installs most people just leave their own languages uh, there is certain user cases for you to have multiple so um, whenever I'm doing analysis in a different language which has a different character encoding so Cyrillic and you know Chinese encoding Japanese encoding um, Sometimes editing that on software can be quite annoying, and so you have to um, you have to alter your locale in Windows. Um, so what I'm gonna, or it could be the language code to be honest. I actually just change everything when I'm doing it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go into the debugger and let's get set off. So I'm just gonna restart it. So we're at the same point. Everyone knows what they're doing. I'm gonna hit run modules rac.exe cool um, I've got my breakpoint set in check musex so I can get to that main area lovely so I'm now in that main area if you remember how we did that last time um, so we were, we're here now and we're going to move over to here um, so yeah let's go in I can even see it there so what we're going to do is we're just going to step over here we get that jump and then we get that subroutine we don't know what's going on there um, and what I'm doing do is just press that way and then we're going to let it get default. We're going to get them to call these and then we're going to go on to the other bits. So we've got two calls, lovely. And then we've got this CL. So the CL is, um, 2F is being moved into CL and then CL is being manipulated three times here, um, which is of interest. And we've also got the similar um, so we saw last time when these were manipulated, they were turned into strings. I call them stack strings, but you could call them um, just you know contents in a, that's pushed to a stack and then manipulated. Um, so I'm just going to step over that. Um, what you can do if you're confused about the CL value and you're not too sure about the registers, we can see it here. It is in the lower 16-bit uh, part of the register here. Um, is that you can actually go Control G in x64 32 and just um, type in CL and then you'll see 2F there which is its actual value. Um, cool, so we're putting these into the memory dump so if I put that, that oh there we go is that alright? Oh, just follow it and dump again there we go so we're going to uh, put these values into there which we see the interesting thing to note here 
is about endianness. So we can see the lower bit and higher bits being changed. So we see A3 and 2F, so 2F's at the start in this value, in this part, but it's not here. So that is a really important thing to take note whenever you see data manipulation are actually just values being manipulated, especially in reverse engineering or anything where you're looking at the lower parts or of an internal system with processors, um, is that just looking at it, in a disassembled form, it will look like this, and then it will be changed. Endianness is really important to try and reproduce this functionality, which we will be doing today in CyberChef. And so you really want to take note of this. So we've got 2F, A2, A5, A3. And actually, we don't want, in this case, A3, A5. So some people will copy and paste this because they'll see it in IDA and then the data manipulation won't go correctly because the endianness is wrong, they're ordered in the wrong way, which means that you don't get the right manipulation. Cool. So I'm then going to add these and we can see the exact same thing has happened to them. A3 is at the start here and it wasn't at the start here, it was at the end. So just really take note of that because that does happen quite often. And then we're going to see, we're going to leave EBX and EDX. I'm assuming we can see the EDX counter um where's that jump okay that's jumping out of it that's probably um oh that's right we'll see what like that jumps up and then we get a not cl so whatever's happening eb what's an ebx okay so it looks like we're initializing the counter there so we can see ebx is set as zero and i don't think we see the lower ends of bl being used here which is moving into that area. Where is that? A8. Okay, is that referenced again? Hmm. We're going to leave that for now and see if that hinders any of our analysis. That might be to do with something else. Um, but let's yeah, let's. This is definitely and it looks like an initialization because EBX is zero. We've got EDX, and then there's an ink and a comparison um, done here where it can jump out, and then we move something in and then restart this loop, which we've seen before. So what we're going to do is we're going to step, we're going to let BL do its business there, um, and then we see a not CL here. So 2F is being manipulated here. Um, again, you can go on the control plus G and see it be manipulated as well. So we see the D0. And then CL is being used here. If I just follow that into dump, where is that then? So that is interesting. Please take note of this. Is we see that 2F, it's referencing, if we look, we've got 6B4 here and we've got 6B3 here. Same calculations. What's interesting here is that 6B4 it's just skipped 2F before it's done this manipulation. So it's skipped a byte already. Um, that's a quite an interesting one. And then we see 6B4 again coming in here and moving into CL. So 2F is not being touched. It's being moved into CL. And then we're seeing the it's jumping back into not CL. So it's being redone if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll walk through that because that is an interesting one. But we're essentially we can see D0 is going to be exclusive ORD with the value 82. 2F has been skipped. Let's see what happens. So we've got the exclusive OR, which turns it into R. And then we as we can see in the dump here. And then we've got an increase, which is the counter. Cool. So EDX. Then we've got the comparison. It isn't over 7 or equal to seven. Um, so we're not going to jump that. It's then moving to F, that 6B4, once again into CL. And then we're going to jump. And then you see that not again, that not operation, which is actually quite inefficient from the compiler. I don't know how this has been done, but that seems really ine inefficient. Could be down to the programmer and them doing it in a really inefficient way, which has led the compiler to doing it and not understanding the optimization that it could have done. Either way, quite weird, but essentially every single 
um, iteration, we're going to be putting 2F and then we're going to knot it so that it's D0 again. So essentially, it looks like you're, look, you're doing a 2F CL here. And then if you ignored the knot, you would think, oh, 2F as an analyst. So here, if we just ignored that knot, people will be like, I see an exclusive or CL. They'll try and do it and it doesn't work. Um, which is a possible reason. I'm not really sure why. Maybe a variance of data manipulation have just added knots and made it just a little bit more complicated and awkward um, so that it's hard to identify and signature. So with that, we've got a knot. We'll let it do the D0 again and we see it's doing exclusive or. So I don't, I think this might be for later on or, or something else to be related to that, but that is in. Uh, that doesn't look to be anything related to what we're doing here. Um, so we see RU. Um, I feel like people probably know at this point what's going to happen here. Um, so I'll let this continue. I feel like I've explained this quite a lot. A lot. If you want to see it slowly or, or can talk about it more, just rewind it. I feel like the registers, it's a pretty slow process. Just slowly look at the assembly code. Google it if you're really not sure about what's going on here and the references. Um, and if you're really not sure and you've, you know, given it a good Google, you can always put a comment in and say, Jack, you didn't make any sense. Please tell me what's going on here. Okay, so we've got the word Russian. Um, and then we've got the uh, null terminator there. So you will need to have, whenever you write a string, um, you will need, especially, well, it's C basics, isn't it? But um, yeah, you need a null terminating string so it's easy to identify that that's a string. I've actually already named this, um, which is a little bit annoying. That wasn't there beforehand. Um, that this was a just a normal call like that, but I've just called it string comparison because that's what it's doing. Um, so we've got, if you may note, the 18E8, if you go up that reference there, so that was loading it into EAX and then pushing it, and then we've got another push to EAX, and EAX, if you remember, is the return value of calls. So we've got this interesting um, return value from these calls, which, as you can see, when I highlight into that area, when I highlight on that instruction, we see it here in this helpful window is that in the location currently there is English and we've got two pushes so we've already got a push which is we haven't got a push because I've not even gone next to it yet so let's do that let's put that there so let's put the instruction pointer there so we've got 6b3 which is Russian we can see that when I highlight onto that instruction that's being loaded into EAX um, so let's do that BL is zero and is going into 6AC again. Very strange. This could be, is that, is that in a 6AC? 6AC, hmm, interesting. That's a real interesting one. Uh, it might be a remnant of the compiler. I'm not really not sure about the instruction, but the beauty about assembly is that you don't have to look at every single instruction. That is the point. At the moment, I am going through very, very granularly this operation, this point here. Now, the reason for that is because it can be important to really focus in on certain parts of the binary. But if I did that for every single bit, especially here, so I made the decision not to look at this. Um, it's really important after a while in reverse engineering, especially malware analysis. When it comes down to overall reverse engineering, the rule might be different. But with definitely malware analysis, you're looking to get as much understanding of basis fun basic functionality, the communication, the way that it operates, possible detection, ways to signature, stuff like that. So you've already got things in your head and then you've got to think about ways that you can, I don't know, unpack, look at this later, notes for you know how to analyze this for other people. So there's a lot you, you need to look at and continue with. But if we look, um, this to me is an interesting thing that I want to be granular in. But that call there wasn't. If we go a little bit further in, we can see, well, that might be, no. See, instantly for me, that is uninteresting. So I went, but if I think it's because the relationship immediately afterwards, we have that loop. 
and I've stepped over. So in a debugger, I've stepped on them and then I've stepped over here and seen it. But I could do that quicker and then see it's actually interesting functionality, restart it and then go into it again. Here, uninteresting initial look. We see a repeated um, functionality as well. We've got two two pushes there, possibly another one there, and then the loop, and then a comparison um, with uh, the length. And then if we go, is that a string comp? Is that what that is? That could be the string comparison. Yeah, I think that's the string comparison in Ida. Um, yeah, from the highlight. If we look, the jumps are looking like it indeed. Um, and the the red, well, yeah, it's really weirdly spaced out, probably because of the size of this subroutine. Um, but this is the loop, essentially. We can see the move CL. Um, but then this, afterwards, it's done this string comparison. So that's that's the reasoning for why I'm looking so granularly into this. Cool. So um, we've moved... Uh, that that was an, yeah that was a weird one. We've got Russian into EAX, which is from the XOR loop that we've seen there. So we're doing a push. We see it in the stack now. We see that there. So now we also see English. That's that's in this location that was referenced previously here, um, which has then been used in these when it's been pushed around here. We could look further in, but this. It does look like that because then EAX is probably manipulated. Actually, I don't think it is until here. Yeah. And EAX, yeah, it's only manipulated there. I can't see any EAX instruction. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the language instruction isn't touched until later on where it's re essentially rewritten. Um, so that reference has been set in uh, the calls when it's putting it into EAX, the memory location, and then, and I'm sure we could look at it and the arguments in the Windows Microsoft Development Network, but then you've also got uh, the push uh, EAX, which we've just looked at. So we've pushed, we've got the Russian, we're about to put now our memory reference in here, and then we're pushing that, and then we're going to have the string comparison, which will then we're doing the pop pop to get rid of English and Russian in the stack. Um, and then uh, we're doing a test for what that result of that call was. So was it Russian? Um, and it wasn't because it's English. So that that's going to be a... Um, that's going to carry on. If we look at this in IDA, what happens when it goes the other way? is we can see it moves here to this location which looks like another repeated use where does it go here we can see it actually goes out so this is pretty consistent with crime based malware where if it's um a ro russian locale code um and we'll see the other ones as well then it will exit out it won't execute the malware if it's the others that it's listed it probably won't as well so if i just double check that um, so we've got that. Will that exit out? Yeah, it's just going to exit out. You can see that in the green and the red goes to this, the next stage bit. So pretty standard for crime-based malware. What we're going to do now is something a little bit interesting is now that we know the functionality, I'm going to restart this and do this in CyberChef. Uh, and the reason for this is that sometimes doing stuff manually with data manipulation helps you to Oh, have I not installed another browser? Oh, well, that's highly dispiriting. Um, okay, right. Well, everyone, I'm so sorry. This is this is what we're dealing with in 2020 now. Um, doing stuff manually like this really helps in trying to understand the mechanism, but also can help in trying to build a system to de-obfuscate and and completely understand the binary. There can be multiple versions of this where you can build up a script to do this. So making it a manual process um, actually makes it a little bit easier for later on in the analysis where you might want to create, I don't know, like a config deobfuscator where it's using similar stuff. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ride to here 
and then I'm going to follow in dump here and I'm going to copy the contents here where it's in the correct format. So we see that we sort of skip of 2F. So I'm actually going to stop there and go here and go to BE because BE is the last bit uh, that we need to look at. And what I'm going to do is right click copy selected lines and then oh, showing a little bit of what I'm going to do in a moment later. So that's annoying. Um, let's just put that there. So now um, I've got rid of the ASCII contents in the because what X32 does is um, it just copies everything that we've got in this line. So the ASCII contents and the address. So what we've, I've done is just remove that and now I'm going to remove that to make sure I've got the correct manipulation. So um, I can see the 2F has been added as well. So I'm just going to remove that because that has to do with the process which we saw where there was the deobfuscation was the exclusive oil. Um, we don't need to do the not now because we know. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put that there. I'm now going to do from hex and you can download this from GitHub uh, to give a localized version. So as you can see here, I've not got the GitHub version of CyberChef. This was created by GCHQ. It allows you to have loads of different, um, you know, manipulation of different um, data formats and encryption, cryptography, loads of different uh, utilities that you really need for when you're analyzing malware and doing just basic security research. So it's really important to have it. Uh, it also has a really cool exclusive or brute force, which can be really nice. Um, so yeah, it's got, it's got quite a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, there we go. Oh, we've got the, got the end of, it's just copied the whole line, hasn't it? There we go. Um, cool. So. What we've got, I know the manipulation of the key is always to D0, so whenever I put, um, and it just helps you actually just verify your findings and making sure you're doubly correct, um, which can be really important. So here we can see the values A2, A5, A3, A3, B9, B9, B1 rather, BE, is when manipulated is Russian. And so, you know, we can now be confident about our functionality and know that we understand the instructions and the lines that we're doing um, instead of always oh, it knotted or not and yeah so very important um, to sort of look at for me at least to get that analysis in your brain and working and correct um, so now that we've got that correct and we understand it um, we can now move on to uh, breakpoints and I'll break point there to the comparison, see it's English, and then we'll go to the next one on the string comparison so we can see the push of what it is. So Ukrainian is also avoided, and we can see, actually it's a little bit easier to see in this disassembled view, not in a graph view in, in either. We can see, essentially we're just getting the locale code and then doing a loop and repeating that operation for a decent amount of time. We see it multiple times here. Um, if I keep scrolling down, uh, yeah, just keeps going, keeps going, string comparison, string comparison, until here. And then there's some weirdness here. You see the differences? There is a string comparison, but there's some weirdness here. This is why I'd stop my analysis, because I don't know what's going on. And then it's entering into a new world. So um, that is where it's interesting if we scroll up again and just work through. So Ukrainian. We can see the differences because they're both pushed to the stack before we get to the string comparison. Um, so uh, that's interesting as well. Um, so we've so far we've got Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, we can see the EIP is there. So now what I'm going to do is jump to this one and let it run. So I've set a breakpoint. Run Belarusian, 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 Belarusian. Yes. Uh, what's next? Kazakh, Kazakhstan. And uh, Kyrgyzstan. So, um, so next one, Armenian. It's pretty clear who they're trying to defend. Parts of what some people call Central Asia, and uh, Tajikistan, Russia as well, Ukraine. Um, pretty understandable where this could pro this is likely to originate from. Uh, Uzbekistan. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is where it starts to get weird, so we're going to leave it there. Um, and if we just take a slight break from the analysis and have a look at the actual in assembly hex instructions here, 
Indie exclusive or we could actually build a signature which is what I've done so instead of using Yara which is a tool that a lot of people in threat intel malware analysis antiviruses use table to um, globally detect um, what universally you know in it's used to detect files um, using certain patterns previously before you would have an antivirus engine that would have their own signaturing ways and features and stuff with Yara it's much easier you can use it um, and a lot of security products use it to be able to scan using classified patterns that you find through reverse engineering so um, with this um, I decided not to use Yara in this video but actually script it up in x64 we will be going through Yara because I think it's interesting but and it's free so it's able to be shown without having to buy a license or do anything like that um, and it just allows you to understand also that Yara is um, an industry standard where a lot of people use it so if you want to get into malware analysis um, or you know threat intelligence in that side of the, the world um, then you certainly do need to learn about Yara rules and how to um, properly detect things um, because you know it, it, it can it can get quite difficult to try and detect things once there's huge video files that are you know full of randomized almost randomized values which um, in combination can look like um, APT or, or crime based malware but is just um, over a hundred megabytes and it's got a load of d data cool so um, there is some repeat here from it um, it's quite hard because x64 doesn't really put these in a good format so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put it into um, IDA and we're going to go to options general and a number of opcodes in the graph um, I'm going to change this up to 8 which is actually quite a lot it will manipulate the graph a little bit um, and what it does is essentially what we've got in the graph which is it shows the um, opcodes which show what the assembly instruction assembly instructions have been disassembled um, so this will represent this and B12F represents move CL um, with the value 2F which is pretty understandable there so with this we can probably try and detect this a little bit easier because one will see 30 which is to do or is associated with the exclusive or um, and we can um, create a regex like and I say regex I mean it includes wildcard so there's certain things here where um, values will be different so for example the length of stuff will be different um, the registers might be different as well they might manipulate that um, this red this reference here is likely to be different the knots might not even appear all the time um, so if we go um, to the yeah here um, so we've got EDX we've got a difference in length um, we've got a 38C so what I like to do is I'll copy this and then I'll compare um, what they look like so what I'm going to do in notepad is I'm going to hold alt and highlight this area which allows me to delete that area then I'm going to replace um, that using extended and I'm going to do that and then I'm going to do double space and replace that with a space I'm going to clean that up because I made a mistake. Fantastic. So we've got that. I'm going to do the same thing for the top version just to compare. Um, there's plenty of tools that you can use that are free still that allow you to do this in a bigger form. But for now, this is how I'm going to do it um, just for ease of use. It's a dirty way of doing things for sure. Um, so this is the new line escape. And I don't want any spaces on that. And then I want double space, and I do want a space for that. I don't know what's happened here, but that's fine. There we go. Cool. Now we can compare these. So we see some similarities here, FCD1. We can see these are different, these are different, these are not. 83, FA, 07. So some differences. Um, and what I did is I actually went throughout the binary 
and made a rule which um, helps me identify all of the different exclusive ors that are likely to be doing with stack strings of what we're looking at. So what you can do in x64 is you can write a script to manipulate the debugger, let it run, set breakpoints, do all sorts of crazy stuff. But what we're going to do today is we're actually just going to look at a script and develop a script so that we can see a lot of the exclusive ors that are going on. Now, Having said that, a lot of the documentation for x64 dpg scripts is not particularly the most um, easy to look at, particularly in the example sense. Um, so it is quite tricky getting your hands on understanding how to use this um, and actually the sort of logic that's used with it. Essentially what we can do though is um, there's a scripts tab here um, which allows us to load scripts in um, and what we can do then is we can log stuff, message stuff out and yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the log here because I'm going to be using that quite a lot and I'm actually just going to reference over now to the find exclusive or um, which is something that I've been developing. It's it's small so it's okay. Um, so we can see here that what I'm essentially asking for is I find all of the possible patterns in this binary and it's very important that it's in the module that you want to do. Um, and now I've given it a load of wildcards related to um, what I've seen in the binary. Now I can't go through every single little bit about this binary unfortunately otherwise this would be an extremely long video where I am literally looking for occurrences but what you can do in um, IDA is you can do sequence of bytes and that's what I've done here find all occurrences um, and we can whoop. Uh, I think I was trying to use wildcards and Ida didn't like it um, but um, we can see there's the 38C if I, if I showed the different user cases that I had and I was searching through it wouldn't be easy but essentially you can search for um, different parts here to have a look and see the differences and work through it and this is what I've came up with um, which is very very wide and shouldn't be used for ER all. The reason why I've got it so wide is because I'm only basing it off one binary so this would not be really a great idea for ER all. Um, a lot of binaries probably have this especially with compressed data um, so what I've got here is I'm trying to find this in this binary um, and with this instruction, whenever we use find or find all, it will always go into result. And then the structures that it creates once you do this sort of instruction means that it will be in the ref. Um, the explanation for this is quite opaque, so I'm not fully sure myself. I believe it's like you're doing a search, um, as in you're searching and it's in the references as I've got here as it's shown and then oh god I'm giving away the, the interesting stuff there we go let's delete all um, so it's like you're doing a search and then you're going through that search um, in, a, in a way so what I've got here is the documentation said that with find all result will give you the total count of um, the findings that you get from it, so the number, um, which I've essentially got here with ref count, but um, just changed it up a little bit. Essentially, you could just do like log and then num or result with um, some expressions here to sort it out, but um, I've just done it in a different way. But what I've got here is a loop. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm decrementing the number in here so we can go down on the references. Um, so here I've set as ref address and then the, the count of the number, the, the reference number that I want. So you can't just like log address immediately. You need to give it the reference. And then from that address, what I've done is I've set it as there's a 
um, type in the log function which says that this is an address to treat this as an address when logging which will give us a nice little hyperlink in the log and then I is basically the information of the address what it actually is um, this will help us to understand is it just a false positive and it just gives us a first quick reference point and then much like other assembly um, what I'm doing is I'm just testing whether this is zero and with that jump not zero go to loop and that's why it's got that there this is essentially a subroutine and then jumping back if it's not zero and then at the very end once we've finished that loop um, I'm logging the amount that we've got and setting that in ref.count which is in the documentation as well is actually the easiest one to look at um, lovely so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just go into the scripts. I'm going to unload this script to make it look like what it would normally do. I'm going to open it up. Uh, you can just, yeah, text files, SCR, whatever. I'm pretty sure you can do all files as well, like it doesn't really matter. I'm going to open it up. Uh, a cool thing with this is you can actually step through this. So if you wanted to see it log, let's do that actually. Let's, let's step through. So um, we've got the find all. Um, we can see 295 occurrences found in 31 milliseconds. We can see that here, um, which is pretty helpful. Um, we'll step and then we'll decrement the number and then it will find the address for us and then it will log the address. See that the log has now changed. So if we go into our log, we can see that it's got a hyperlink. Um, if we just do it one more time so that we get the... Uh, information we can see in the log what it actually is we can see the reference to cl we can click here and we can see this is actually the reference to uh i believe the russian one is that oh no that's the mutex oh no it's not it's the explorer that's explorer.exe so it hasn't caught which is interesting it hasn't caught the mutex one which is interesting and maybe I want to look at. So that's our first one, which is a valid detection. We've got it from here. Um, so that's a valid detection of that. Um, and then, so we can make this more advanced later on where we can possibly try and get everything decoded. But for now, we've just got this simple script. So we're just going to step one more time and then another, and we see it loops back. Um, so that's really good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hit spacebar, which is run for in a script. So I'm just going to run. The script's finished. Uh, the amount is 127. That's a bit concerning. Um, but we'll see how this goes. That can't be right. Maybe there was multiple references of the occurrences. I'll have to recheck. But we see all of the occurrences. If we go into them, we see that they've got the similar format, which is the stack string format, with an exclusive or. So we've got 74 as the starting point for the key, but then the data and then the not, uh, but the exclusive or. So what we could actually do is search for this and then we don't even need to worry about this because we've got the key already here, which is pretty interesting. Cool. Okay, so now that we've sorted that out, we've gone through some detection of exclusive or I'm going to leave us with a uh, starting point for the next part, which will be going into the communication mechanism. So we've seen that this basically it looks for languages and then from there it will um, continue on if it isn't the languages that it says it is. So let's see where EIP is. We are at... Uzbekistan English do we have to continue oh no we've got some yep so we're at the interesting point uh, we went through all of the languages before I went into the script and did the logging these will become of interest later um, but for now um, we are now on the string comparison we see this which will be interesting so what we're going to do is we're going to step past the we are not Uzbekistan we are in an English language PC. Uh, we see that we're not going to step over into the exit. We should probably label that as exit out, as that could probably be quite interesting later. Um, yeah. Um, could be useful. Um, and then we see a large amount of stuff being moved 
into XM00. So let's have a look at that. So the, let's follow that in dump. And that will go into scroll down here. You'll see that in here. Um, so let's see that go in there. See, we see the 62 again. Endianness, you want to watch yourself. E7 is at the front, 62 here is um, at the back. Um, so, yeah, we've got the, the 16 bytes that are going to be likely manipulated because I can see something that we've seen before, which is um, the exclusive or with the not and the bytes. Um, so let's see what we've got here. So we're going to continue on. So this is where the technique, now that we've understood it, we've looked into it, we've seen something of interest, now it's repeating itself. It's something that we can now move on with and know with confidence what's going on here. So we've looked at this granularly now, so I can walk through it and think, right, that's moving into there. We've seen CF. It'll move, not, and then it'll be manipulated here, which will be in this location here. Then it'll... Um, increase so there is a slight difference in there not being that uh, multiple jumps just the one um, so we got 9d into CL CL uh, 62 is that the same every time let's find out 9d and then exclusive or again and then we're going to increase yeah it is the same every time so it is similar just more optimized okay so we know what's going to go on there we can see it live manipulating the data so what we're going to do from here is I'm actually just going to let that be manipulated I'm not too worried because I can see that there's no jumps I would be worried if that was there because we could jump out of it. We've got no way of jumping out. Um, I've got some confidence with this. I'm going to break point there. Um, it's probably going to go all wrong. There we go. Lovely. So the difference here is I think I've gone in the wrong place for the manipulation of this. Uh, hopefully it's still in place or we can restart. I'm just going to double check that just to be sure that I've got that right. Just to be sure. Because I don't want to be wrong. And there's nothing wrong with taking your time. Um, so we're at the point. I'm going to put that there. Okay, yeah, that's different. I didn't go to the right place. Don't mind me. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so we see that now. A um, little bit different to the previous. So there we go. That is the correct. That is the correct. Um, there we go. Value that it was trying to exclusive or with the same amount. So we see some possible base 64 and the reason for that is because we see the equals equals um, this could be um, encrypted stuff um, the way I'm saying it, encrypted in the way that it's uh, base 64 encoded in a cryptographic algorithm instead of a exclusive or so let's have a look we've got some push and then we've got uh, 7f coming into ECX was that right? No, I'm wrong. What am I looking at? The va oh, the address, load effective address, sorry. Um, and then we're moving BL0 into a byte, and then we've got this. So if we go into IDA, um, this was the strange exclusive order. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and we've got this. Now we've got two well, three repeated with strings. Um, then we've got two here, um, which is pretty... You you want to be watching this because this is where it becomes interesting because you have to w 
try and understand what's a compiler and what's a string function and um, that is looking quite compilery to me the reason for it is the the reference to the string and then the it happening three times um they're all different this is not base 64 um they've got spaces in as well which is really strange um <laughs> um what <laughs> okay so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to say define string somewhat it's probably not it but i'm just going to let it roll and see see what happens so we've got if it goes into a new space yes that could be it. Then we've got another base64 string or base64 like. That's pushed there as well. So that's looking a bit defining. Um, then we've got what we could do to um, help here is we can see that there's still base64. Um, there's been three. There's two base64 strings and there's two 26Fs. One, two, one, three. We've got three one five two eight A's. Ah, we've got three or four of the five. That's quite a lot. That's interesting. Uh two, three. I'm looking for a base sixty four string function which will likely be a decode. Um, you'll see like a equals and then it it's a, it'll look crazy, but it, um, it'll make sense. 29E? Is that only two? No, that's three. And we've got the F. 28E. Hmm. All right, so from here, yeah. Interesting. That's not very interesting at all, actually. Uh, I'm gonna just so that I don't go into it at all. Again, not as interesting as what we want. Um, this could have potential. Mm, I'm really looking for something that tells me straight away that this is base 64. Mm, contender, but not immediate. I keep clicking into the same things but I have to look further and further into them. Um, hmm. Really looking to see what... I'm, I'm taking a theory here. I'm looking for something that I'm used to seeing. Yeah. So two B two F plus um seeing a yeah, this is looking this is looking good. Three D equals the yeah, This is looking so this is likely Base 64 decode. Let's see what happens here. And the reason for that is because of the base 64 decode strings. We've got two of those, which is part of the theory. We've got a lot of junk subs there. And when I mean junk, I mean things that don't immediately pop out at me. Um, we've got, yeah, we've got some strange things going on here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to base 64 decode this and see the 
and this is what we can do in CyberChef um, see the, the result of it and now it is a little bit slower in a VM so it's a little bit annoying so sorry about that that looks like gobbledygook but what you want to be doing to that is put that into hex and then we get a nice little clear what what is going on um, so now to test out the theory now there could be a lot of issues with what I'm about to do because there could be more important instructions and subroutines here from what I've seen so far I think I could probably reach to here without too much trouble could hit it but it's fine we're in a VM we can revert we can break point we can restart it not too bad and taking a punt I'm gonna look for the a06 I can see that here um, yeah that's what I'm gonna do a06 so there's gonna be a lot of junk here so I'm gonna just scroll down very very slowly so, you know, see whether I can find it a06 possible base 64 decode there we go lovely and we are quite far away from that so let's I actually I'm just going to step over to see some functionality to see if we're missing anything really important um, just to make sure we're not doing anything dumb um, which we probably are but that's that's the way with reverse engineering seeing a lot of different ways of it could be that it's removing the spaces which is a possibility um, why they're doing that who knows um, just continue on let me just double check what's going Ooh. still there we've still got the spaces until the null terminator the zero zero, zero. um which is there very strange very very strange but we'll we'll go on we'll continue on still seeing the manipulation um How far are we? Yeah, we're not too far away, but we are hitting a lot of functions here where I'm just ignoring them, but see where it goes. Um, okay. Okay, we're finally at the bit. I'm <laughs> still very hesitant what happened there. Could be down to string compilers intricacies with strings ah we can see from that call that we can see now the thing that it's about to put in has been shortened down with the spaces we see the spaces here the 20 20 20 20 if I put uh, the value we see that null terminator is now there where it's been added so it could have been calculating the string length, what's going on there, and now it's base64 strings, and then it could define it. So this could be this could be a good thing for us. So let's base64 decode. Um, now we're getting two pushes. Uh, one is the base64, and then we get another one, which I'm assuming might be the result from this. So, hmm, maybe. Um, let's see, this is, hmm, let's see, so let's go into EAX, so we see D0, hmm, not so sh certain on that, but what's, is that, that could be our address actually, this. Yeah, so address right. Follow D word and current dump. What have we got? A nine, A nine looking good. Two five five D zero one B eight. Let's have a look. E zero. Uh, e zero. Two five D. So where does that change? Eight C eight C. Oh no, we've we've got this right. It's a little bit longer than I anticipated. So the the last value would be A one. A1, yeah, cool. So that really confusing part comes down to it being um, defining a load of strings, 
um, making sure that the, I mean, I'm not certain, I haven't looked at it completely, but trimming it down from the spaces and then base 64 decoding it. And as you can see, it, it can get quite confusing and unsure about it, especially with um, assembly where it's, you know, you're, you're really having to look at everything possibly to look at. But that's something that we're going to be looking at later on in part three is the what this result is and what's going on here. Um, Spoiler alert, it's related to the communications that the Steeler does, and that's what we'll be looking in part three. Hopefully this was interesting to you guys again, and you enjoyed it somewhat. That was a, I think, possibly over an hour. The last time I checked it was 45 minutes, um, but it's, it's certainly longer than that. If you enjoyed, please give it a like, and um, comment down below if there was anything confusing, something that I didn't go over too much. I know near the end there was just having a look and trying to work out what was going on live so it's it's really peculiar trying to watch it and try and understand it live and try and put that into a video um, so hopefully that thought process and the deliberation and unsureness of myself um, gives you confidence that not everyone knows everything about reverse engineering when they do YouTube videos anyway I'll see you guys in part three <laughs>